But China is a big investor in some other countries. And that money is going to dry up. This could be trouble for Australia, Brazil, and everyone getting money through the Belt and Road Initiative. Some are still holding out hope that the CCP will inject more money into the system and try to reinflate. But messaging and policy has actually indicated the opposite. Investment-led growth has run its course, but this slowdown will not only impact the property market, it's going to have ripple effects throughout the Chinese economy, particularly construction, cement, and steel. In Argentina and Turkey, inflation is out of control. In places like the US and Germany, inflation is embedded in a political hot button, but in China, deflation is a whole lot scarier. This means a housing collapse with the Chinese middle class gets its wealth wiped out. At the same time, if development projects get shut down, enormous portions of the workforce will be unemployed. So the government needs to invest in other sectors of the economy to try and keep some portion of the house of cards standing. It's hard to measure exactly how much investment is required, but China experts like Brian McCarthy estimate they must be near a 10% annual growth rate to avoid economic collapse. This would require around $5 trillion of new credit issuance per year, which would inevitably lead to oversupply in the export-driven industries that government prioritizes if the CCP is set on success in electric vehicles. They won't wait around for the market to produce some EV companies. Instead, they'll invite foreign EV companies to manufacture their cars in China for preferential rates, then steal as much of their IP as possible. With that, they'll see dozens of EV companies with government subsidies and cheap loans through banks. Those companies will compete to the death within China for dominance. The survivor will become a national champion that is too big to fail due to geopolitical significance, employment of the population, and national prestige. Unfortunately, along the way, the subsidies and cheap loans will lead to the overproduction of that targeted good. While the Chinese population's wealth has been growing, and they can consume some of this production, a balance sheet recession means that the majority of this is going to have to be exported. And we can see this oversupply in the export data. Chinese steel exports are surging up by over 40 million tons. Passenger vehicle exports have surged over 5 million cars a year in other sectors, like batteries. Chinese capacity is four times domestic demand. Chinese capacity for solar panels exceeds even the most optimistic estimates for global demand. So when these huge supplies reach another country's shores, leaders find themselves in a conundrum. Should we allow our population to buy these cheap goods? Consumers will be happy. And if it's cheap t-shirts, then who cares, right? But what about key technology products that decimate local companies who can't produce them as cheaply WTO members like the US? India and Brazil all employ tariffs on the import of foreign cars. The EU protects agriculture, steel, and chemical industries. These are all industries that China's central planners have targeted because of their strategic significance. Even one of China's partners in BRICS is getting concerned. If China's manufacturers can't find markets abroad to sell into, then its economic miracle is over. Now, before we get into the challenges of China's energy security, we need to talk about why the exact date of economic collapse is going to be impossible to predict. The Chinese government operates a totalitarian one-party state. If you live in a democracy with two or more parties, the dynamics of an economic crisis is quite different. Basically, the electorate kicks out the ruling party of power. But in a one-party state, there's no such relief valve. A genuine economic crisis means that people start marching in the streets. So they will literally do anything to avoid that scenario. Everything that can be kicked down the road will be kicked until it can't be kicked any further. One of the steps to prevent collapse is to muddy the information environment. Some folks watching this video might even say that's not what the data says China's economy is growing and unemployment is low. Ask that person, how do you know that? See, for the last decade, China has been slowly removing access to data about the Chinese economy. Today, access from outside China to all economic databases has been completely cut off, including corporate information on Hong Kong and mainland companies. No customs data, no financial information whatsoever. They cut off customs data access in 2018. In 2021 alone, Chinese customs reported $400 billion more than the State Administration of Foreign Exchange did data streams like when the most expensive database used by the universities and hedge funds can now only be accessed by trusted IP sites within mainland China. But even those data streams keep disappearing. As outside observers, we have to evaluate this at a meta level. Are they hiding weakness or concealing strength? Back when the industrialist John D. Rockefeller was conquering the oil market, he had a highly persuasive move when attempting to acquire one of his competitors. He kept meticulous records of his company's operations, including costs, profits, and production volumes. When competitors tried to challenge Standard Oil, Rockefeller would sometimes invite them to his office and show them his books. The sheer size and profitability of Standard Oil, as documented in Rockefeller's records, often demoralized his rivals. Many realized they could not hope to compete with the scale and efficiency of Rockefeller's operations. Some chose to sell their business to Standard Oil rather than try to compete. This strategy contributed to Rockefeller's ability to consolidate the oil industry and build Standard Oil into a powerful monopoly. If Xi Jinping's economy was firing on all cylinders, wouldn't he want the world to know when that helped him secure more cheap financing for domestic companies and demoralize Indo-Pacific competitors in joining his Belt and Road Initiative? 
the 2024 National People's Congress announced that their target is 5% GDP growth, with inflation targeted at 3%. The Premier's work report suggests all problems will be solved, and the government will be restrained in terms of stimulus, and by some means or another. The reported data will officially say 5% GDP growth. Don't buy it. Hey, do you find this interesting? Please leave a like if you do, it really helps with the algorithm, thanks. In order to have a chance of hitting those GDP targets, China will need a lot of energy. It is already the world's largest energy consumer, and growth requires energy. Most of China's domestic oil production occurs in its northeastern provinces. However, the Diking, Xiangli, and Laohe oil fields have been declining in recent years due to the depletion of mature oil fields and the increasing complexity of exploiting remaining reserves. It seems their domestic crude production has topped out around 4 million barrels per day, leaving a substantial gap to be filled by imports. China imports approximately of its crude oil, with Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iraq, and Angola being their biggest suppliers. This heavy reliance on foreign oil leaves China vulnerable to supply disruptions in price volatility. Any geopolitical events affecting these key suppliers, or disruptions of critical shipping routes, such as the Strait of Malacca, could have severe consequences for China's energy security. A sudden increase in global energy prices would exacerbate China's economic challenges, leading to its increased production costs and affecting overall economic stability. And the probability of this is increase Ukraine is targeting oil refineries as part of their attempt to slow the Russian war machine. As Iranian proxies attack Israel, their oil assets become an increasingly appealing target. Additionally, Venezuela, Libya, Nigeria, and Guyana all face increasingly unstable geopolitical situations that could impact international oil markets. China's backing of Russia in the Ukraine war should have triggered Beijing to lock down energy production in Southeast Asia and the Persian Gulf in anticipation of rising energy insecurity. Instead, the U.S. government started importing Russian crude and mass. This means China has collected the world's second-largest strategic petroleum reserves in the world after the United States. Although the exact size of China's reserve is not officially disclosed, various estimates from energy analysts suggested to be around 550 million barrels that would only cover 90 days of consumption. China is one major energy shock away from its debt deflation going non-linear. So what happens when a $50 trillion debt bubble comes apart? Well, for one, the banks are in trouble. They're the ones that originated a majority of these loans, and they hold a bunch of them on their balance sheet. China has the four largest banks in the world. These state-owned enterprises are all larger than JP Morgan, the industrial and commercial bank of China. The world's largest bank has a loan portfolio of over 3.5 trillion, with a significant portion tied to the real estate sector. The China Construction Bank, the Agricultural Bank of China, and the Bank of China also have substantial exposure to property loans as state-owned entities. These banks face an impossible trade-off during a debt deflation scenario. A collapse in lending activity would lead to widespread business failures and job losses, exacerbating the economic slowdown, so there will be pressure to continue lending. But stacking worse and worse loans onto their balance sheets will eventually wipe out the equity of these banks' shareholders. Particularly, offshore investors will find their capital erased as the CCP tries to fill the gaping hole in the national balance sheet. After that, they will recapitalize the banks, but not before wiping out equity holders. But it's not limited to the banks shadow banking has added fuel to the real estate bubble. Trust loans and wealth management products have been used to circumvent regulations on traditional bank lending, allowing developers to access credit even as the formal banking system tightens. These products often have higher interest rates and shorter maturities, making them even more vulnerable to a downturn in the property market. As defaults rise, the opaque nature of these products and their interconnectedness with the formal banking system could amplify the effects of a debt deflation scenario. This is a wicked setup. Property prices falling leading to all sorts of defaults and foreclosures means that these banks and shadow banks can only acquire the properties that they were financing, but they can't sell those properties. This path will be painful, no matter when it happens or who it hits. First, policymakers are staring down the barrel of an economic depression, and there's really only one lever they can. A sharp devaluation of the yuan might be the only escape valve for the central planners of the Chinese economy. By dropping the ratio of yuan to USD from 7 to 10 or 12, they would effectively inflate away some of the country's debt by reducing the real value of outstanding.